Luke chapter 15. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. How to cope with your family, extended family and friends. Amen. <laughs> I went to TDY, a temporary duty to Guam. When I returned that night, I got a call from my brother. He says, I was wondering if I can come and live with you guys a few days. <laughs> a few days turned to weeks. Weeks became months. Been there? Years. <laughs> Someone says years. What do you do? When someone calls, and sometimes it's no fault of their own. They may have lost a job. They may have been forced out of their home. May have been a victim of domestic violence or substance abuse. But they call you and they need your help tonight. First of all, we pray. We want to be in line with God's will. We pray. We ask God for guidance and direction. That's our first point of order. We don't move until God moves. And God will give you clarity. God, give me clarity about how to deal with this situation. Because sometimes it's a challenge for us. It's a hardship. We're not prepared for it. And now other people's issues are being brought into your home and your family. And because they are family or a friend or a close friend, you feel the obligation that you have to do something. You have to respond. Today I want to try and establish some kind of biblical order, a foundation about how we are to deal with family, extended family and friends. This young boy was clearly reached a point where he was frustrated with being at home. I would say he's about 18 you remember that? <laughs> 19, maybe younger for some, maybe 16. But there's a point where you, you're frustrated. And he went to his father and he asked for his portion. It was common during this time for the inheritance would go to the children. But this didn't happen until after the father's death. So this boy was being a little bit insulting here, saying, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. <laughs> if there's anything coming to me, I would like my portion now. So this boy was saying, I'm tired of the rules I have to live under. I'm tired of uh, the culture. And to be frank, Dad, I'm tired of you. <laughs> so I would like my portion. Number one says, a person's circle of influence directs their behavior. Somewhere this boy's influences had gotten to the point to where he wanted to go elsewhere. My mother would say, so you're grown now. Or my dad, are you grown now? I've heard that once. I've heard it a thousand times. Any times you question anything about where you live, they'll say, so you're grown now. <laughs> In other words, are you ready to move out? Hmm? To my dad's death, I was still afraid. Is that right? We had a home where mama didn't work and daddy didn't play. Right? We, had, we grew up in a two-story house. Mama had her story. <laughs> Prodigal son. Prodigal son. Prodigal means wasteful, particularly when it comes to money. When a person is prodigal, they waste not just money, they waste time. They waste potential. They waste their energy. When you're prodigal, you're argumentative. And what this boy really wanted was freedom. Is that what he asked for? I want freedom. And you find that when you get older, freedom has a different meaning, doesn't it? When you're younger, freedom just means getting away from home. But when you get away from home, you find that you also have the freedom to pay rent. You have the freedom to pay for your own car insurance. The freedom to live paycheck to paycheck. 
with that freedom, it's not free. Because in our mindset, we believe that freedom means being able to do what we want when we want it. I want freedom. I want it now. His relationship was tested. The Bible did not say how long it took for this boy to come to his realization. But as soon as this boy left home, he started partying. I don't know how much money he had, but when you're younger, it always seemed like it goes a lot further. What you think is going to last six months, lasts six weeks, right? Months become weeks. Weeks become days. Paycheck to paycheck. You ever work out a budget and say, this should last, I should be able to go this long? And then you look back after a couple weeks and say, where did the money go? Well, this is a young boy got out. He started living. And the Bible says he got to a bad situation. When all of his money was gone, so was his friends. And now he had to face a destitute situation. But that's when pride kicks in. Because when pride is steering the ship, when pride is steering the ship, you don't want to surrender. You don't want to go back and say you were wrong. So you just keep on with pride. You keep digging the hole deeper and deeper. And figure somehow if you dig deep enough, you'll dig your way out. That's pride. And he was at a point where the Bible says he was feeding the swine. Now this is in Jewish culture. This is an insult. This is unclean. Number two says, those whom God loves, he chastens. Those whom God loves, he chastens. Hebrews 12 and verse number 11 says that no chastening or no discipline seems pleasant at the present time, but what? Painful. Okay, let's go back to that. No discipline, because whom God loves, he chastens. Right? And the Bible says, train up a child, in other words, discipline a child in the way he should go. So they're accustomed to discipline. Whom God loves, he chastens. No discipline, no training seems pleasant at the present time, but painful. That means that while you're training up, while you're going through discipline, while God is taking you through this, you will perceive this as pain. And no one wants to go through pain because they don't understand the results. We have a saying in, in the gym, Wayne, it says, no pain, what? No pain. I was talking to Wayne. <laughs> no pain, no gain. That means that in order to get to the gain, the place you want to be, you're going to endure some pain. It's not going to be pleasant as you're going through the gym and working out, but you got to know that the discipline produces something. Your discipline produces a harvest of something. That if you work hard enough, go through the pain, go through the endurance, then you will produce a result. And the Bible says it's a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, if you do not want to go through that discipline, then you will suffer as a result and you will not receive the harvest of righteousness and peace. And many people do not want to be disciplined. This young boy was going through a very disciplined life and he got to a point where he did not want to have discipline in his life anymore. I don't want to go anymore. I want to go and have my own life where I can do it my way under my own rules. But while we're going through, God will chase us and take us through discipline. As a parent is shaping his children, they will go through discipline. There are a lot of things you will not want to do as God is chastening you. It's not pleasant. In fact, you will say, this is painful. I want a way out of this. And that's why when people are being dealt with, and it's working, but they don't like it. And they'll quit the job because they don't like it. And they'll call you and say, I need help because I just quit my job. Because some people didn't like me at work. You say, well, I don't like you either. <laughs> but we would quit because something was unpleasant. But as you go through unpleasant situations, that's where we grow, right? Discipline is where we grow. I want you to look at Genesis for me for a moment. Genesis chapter number 39. We've gone through the Bible in one year. So Genesis chapter 39, it shows how God disciplines and how God chastens. Genesis 39, verse number two. Now, Jacob had a brother named Esau. Esau was, they were the sons of who? Jacob and Esau were the sons of Isaac. All right. Jacob and Esau, Jacob was the favorite of his mother. Remember? 
And Jacob also is the one that had the blessing and birthright. Now, he was a deceiver. He was a grabber. He was a trickster. Whatever Jacob wanted, Jacob found a way to get it. He was a trickster. But God loved him, but God couldn't use a trickster. So God had to chasten Jacob. You see? Sometimes God wants to use you, but he can't use the qualities, the way you're doing it right now. So God wants to chasten you. So God moves you through some disciplinary situations as he's chastening you. But we don't like what God is doing. We want out of what God is doing. So God took Jacob away from Esau because Esau had found out that Jacob deceived him. Esau had sought to kill his brother. So Jacob fled to live with his uncle. So for 20 years, for 20 years, Jacob was chastened and disciplined and mistreated and misused and abused by his uncle. But somewhere along the line, Jacob understood that God was in it. When you know God is with you, you know that you're not going to go through always good days. You're also going to go through some bad days. As God's with you, you're going to have some sunshine, but you're also going to have some rain. Jacob knew that God was with him. And Jacob went 20 years with his uncle Laban before Jacob was released. But when Jacob was released, God recognized that now he was no longer the old Jacob. All things had become new because he allowed God to complete the work that was needed to be done in him. Okay? There's a work that needs to be done. And while you're in it, while you're down there, it's not going to be pleasant to go through the discipline and chastening as you're getting to where God wants you to be. But ultimately, Jacob went through 20 years of discipline that he didn't get at home. Because if he got it at home, he wouldn't have had to been dealing with this with God. Is that right? If you train up your children the way they should go, God would not have to deal with them so much afterwards. But if we don't learn those lessons at home, then we're dealing with situations after we leave home because we've not been chastened and disciplined. Now, Joseph was also the son of Jacob. We're still going to learn Jacob, then Joseph. Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph was his favorite, right? Favorite son. He was so favored that God, that Jacob gave him a coat of what? Many colors. So Joseph was the, he was the kid. In fact, he would go to his brothers and tell them the dreams that he had. Guys, I had a dream that all y'all was my slaves. <laughs> yeah, y'all were worshiping me. Watch that. Watch the coat now. Watch that. Back. And he would just boast. And a couple times he went out and told his brothers his dreams. And his brothers hated him. The Bible said they hated him so much. They said, let's kill him. Somebody say, but God. See, Jacob was, I mean, Jacob had a favorite son out of 12 who was Joseph. And as long as the favor of Jacob was on Joseph, God couldn't use him. You see that? There's a place where God has to be the primary and the prime favor in your life. So God had to move Joseph away from Jacob so he can use him. Because Joseph went around thinking that he was the guy. He was a kid, the boss with the hot sauce. What happened is they put him, his brothers, his brothers sold him into slavery. Sold him into slavery. He was now bought by an Egyptian officer named Potiphar. Potiphar had him as a servant. And everything that Joseph touched, God blessed. That's God. But God took him away, made him a slave first. He put him in a situation that was degrading and demeaning to him as God was chastening him. Now in Genesis 39 and verse number two, it says the Lord was what? With Joseph. That's good. That's right there. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. How can you be a successful man as a slave? How can you be a successful man when nothing seems to be going right? When you've lost your family, you lost your coat of many colors. Because your success is not on where you are, it's on where God is. Yes. And if where you are, God is with you, you're successful. Amen. It says where he, God was with him and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. And this is after Joseph got thrown into prison. He went from being a slave, a servant, now he's thrown into prison. 
The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So everywhere that Joseph went, God showed him favor. I'm just saying that there are people that's in your life that's coming to know you and God is chasing them. God is doing a work in them and it's not pleasant to them because God is trying to purge away from them all the things that they have become accustomed to so that God can really use them. But to them it's unpleasant. When your child is suffering and struggling, you got to know, is this really God trying to work with them or is it really time for you to give them a rescue? Is it time for you to buy them out of that trouble or this is an opportunity for them to turn to God and know that he is the maker and creator and keeper? Is it time for them to start depending on him for everything? Because as long as you're there, the favor of God really cannot rest completely upon them because you are constantly there. My mother taught us very well when we left that you're in God's hands now. Now I know that I could have always went back home. But I knew that there was something in me that knew that I had to now depend on God from this point forward. I knew that I was going to go through struggles, but it was something that God was going to be able to see me through. Joseph went into prison and, and even then Joseph had in prison favor. The king's butler, the king's baker was thrown into prison. Right. You read this, right? You read this. Yeah. The king's butler and baker was thrown into prison. Joseph was there and they each had a dream. And they came to Joseph. Now Joseph had a choice to make. While he was at his low point, does he still honor God? Because when we're not feeling good and things are not going well, we want to give up on God. We want to give up on any kind of, we don't know. We don't want to have any, I'm in a bad place right now. Jacob could have said, no, see the last time I had dreams, it put me in a bad situation. So I'm out of the dream business. But he interpreted their dreams. He says, one, you're going to go, in three days, you're going to be hanged. In three days, you're going to be set free. You'll go back to serving the king. But please remember me when you go back. But when he went back, he forgot about Joseph. Because God was saying, it's not time yet. Sometimes you want out and God says, you're not ready yet. You think you're ready, but you're not ready yet. God is still dealing with you. You want it now, but you're not ready. You can't handle it now. And God will give it to you when he knows you're prepared to receive it. And the challenge is that we get frustrated, we get angry because we really do want it now. But one of the things you do if someone needs to come and stay with you, you create an expectation. (coughs) Expectation. So if you're going to stay here, then hear the terms. You state the terms and conditions and penalties. The terms, if you're going to stay here, I expect this from you. These are the things that I expect from you as you're here. We are a home that serves the Lord. So you'll go to church with us every Sunday. That's the rules of our home. If you'll stay here and you're welcome to stay, but there are some things that has to be taken care of. They should know that it's not easy. It's not easy. We're allowing you to be part of this family. And we really believe in you. and We trust you and we want to help. But there's expectations that we have. And all you're doing is taking them through discipline. If they don't want to abide by discipline, then you have to let them know that this is this is the rules of how we're going to have our relationship. Whether that's a child who comes back home, a friend, a family member. There's certain rules and expectations. Number three. Some people need to get the full revelation. Nothing is more powerful than a revelation whose time has come. Romans chapter number one, verse number 28. It says, even as they did not like to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. So what this is talking about as a revelation is when you finally get that moment where you recognize the truth. There's an aha moment where you realize where you are. We talked in our little class this morning. If you've ever gone to a place where you've never gone before, there's usually a directory. And directory has all kind of locations and places there. In order for you to get to where you want to go, you need to know two things. You need to know where you are and where you're going. If you do not know where you are or where you're going, you are lost. And a lot of people are lost because they have no destiny. They do not know where they are. But they want somebody else to be there where they're going to come to you and pull you down to where I am. You have to try to find what is your destiny? What is your goals? What is your future? 
If a person does not have a direction in their life, then how are you going to be able to help a person with no direction? What's your goal? What's your desire? What can we help you with? Help them to try and chart out a course. But if they have no direction in their life, nothing that they're hoping for, aspiring to, then they're going to pull you down to where they are. They will drain you. You need to know where you are and where you're going. The Bible says that God turned them over to a debased mind. That means that whatever they can think of, God just let them start thinking and take their, their minds to whatever vile places. And they will suffer whatever the consequences of vile thinking. Because when God turns them over, God allows them to suffer whatever the penalties of their evil thinking. Now God will still look after and protect them. While they're going through all kind of issues, God is there. But God does not follow you into certain situations. God stands at the door. Is that right? It's up to us to come back to him. Because people want to pray and bring God into situations. God says, no, you know where I am. And we have to rise up to where God is. Because we want to pray God into our situation. God says, no, you know you come to where I am. When the Hebrew boys were going into the furnace, they wanted God in their mind to maybe keep them out of the furnace. God says, no, I'm going to have you go into the furnace. Because I want you to know that I can meet you in low places. And when you know that God is not limited, that wherever somebody can go, God will meet them there. You don't have to keep them out. Sometimes they'll find God in. They have to get to a place where they have to find God for themselves. And as long as you're trying to play God in their lives or trying to intervene, you're not allowing them to get to the place where they ultimately need to find him. The Hebrew... The Hebrew boys found God in a fiery furnace. Isn't that something? Daniel found God in a lion's den. A situation which ultimately would not allow them to survive, but they had to get to a situation sometimes so low before they would really allow God access. And as God is working with them and they're going down, if you, would, you try to help them, somehow you'll hinder them because you didn't allow them to have access to God. There was a friend of mine that I loved him. Uh, and I, w- I was always helping him, always reaching out to him. Whenever he had a need, I always wanted to be there. I felt somehow responsible. And I was in a position where I could help him. So I was always there and he was always calling me at different hours of the night. And then I realized that I was not really helping him. I started to say no. And I saw him at the, one of the last points. He was at the lowest point I've ever seen him in his life. He came into my office and he had looked like he had been on the street for days. And he just wanted help again. I told him no. And that was the most difficult thing that I could have done. Was I watched him walk away and just disappear from sight. Not knowing if I'd ever see him again. But I didn't see him again for another few months. And when I saw him those months later, he says, Dr. Gene, I want to let you know that I'm in ministry right now. He was now a licensed candidate for ministry. Is God good? But God had to take him to the lowest point. And every time I gave him a lifeline, every time I was throwing out and helping him, I was really hindering him from what God was trying to do in his life. He had to reach the point where he could look up and see God for himself. As long as he looked up and saw me, he was missing God. He had to look up to the hills for where comes his help. His help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. His help does not come from me. The real help, the real help that your family, your friends, extended family needs is a help that can only come from him. Not saying that we do not help. I'm not saying turn a cold shoulder. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that what they really need is Jesus. And you cannot be Jesus in their life. There's only one God. And when they're telling you that they don't want to go to church, they don't want Jesus, I'm not ready yet. They're just, they're just saying, I'm not finished. God is not done with me yet. And you have to interpret it. They're still on a journey. And they're being stubborn and they're taking their own time as they're finding their way to Jesus. Sometimes it's a lonesome journey. Sometimes you find him at the lowest point of your life. Break down or break through. But God will never disappoint. Never disappoint. At that lowest hour, they'll remember 
where Jesus is. There was a young boy that was lost. And he couldn't remember his address. The police found him and they said, son, where do you live? He couldn't remember his address. He says, well, can you remember the street name or anything about it? He says, no, I can't remember it. And they got frustrated. They said, son, can you tell us something about where you live? He couldn't remember. He says, there's something I do remember. He says, if you take me to the church, I can find my way home from there. If you take me back to the church and say, what's the church like? He said, he described the church. They knew exactly which church this boy was talking about. But this boy had grown up in the church. He says, I don't know where I live. I don't know the address. I don't know that. But if you took me to church, I can show you how to get home from there. And they took him to the church. And from there, he says, okay, now you go this direction. Now you pass the schoolhouse, take through town, go past the grocery store, turn right, and that's where his house was. He remembered. We remember. If we look up, we know where Jesus is. But are we ready to go to church? Sometimes people are not ready to go to church. They, they want you to help them, but they're not ready to find Jesus yet. Because a lot of people want to blame everybody for why they are where they are. It's how I grew up. I was abused. I was neglected. I never knew my father. It wasn't his father's fault. As he looked around the situation, how did he get here? The second thing he realized is that he knew that his father must have loved him in order to let him go. How much his father had to love him, knowing that his son wasn't prepared. But the father says, I'm going to give you what you believe you need. But he trusted God was going to take care of him. And lastly, this boy realized that his father believed in him and trusted in God. Here's some things it teaches us from this parable. It teaches us that the depths to which the misuse of our freedom can bring us. You have so many things to be thankful for right now. So many things in your life to be grateful for. But if we misuse the freedom that God has given us, this misuse of freedom can bring us low. Secondly, pride can bring a person to low points in their life. When we believe that the only way that things are going to be better is that we have to take control. And we don't want to give control to God anymore. We want to be in charge. Pride will make us believe that we don't need God. We don't need mom and dad. We don't need anybody else. I can do it all by myself. And pride puts people in low places. And the last thing that we can learn, is the farther we get away from God's loving care, the worse off we'll be. The further we get away from the dark, from the light, the more darkness shows up. The sun did not break sonship. He'd only broken fellowship. And one thing that the father saw was his son went away a boy, but he came home a man. <laughs>